This is the second time I've tried to record this sermon. If you uh, watched it the first time and managed somehow to get all the way through it, then God bless you for that. It, I had some technical problems on my end, probably low battery on my laptop, something like that. Anyway, the quality was just horrible. I took it down. We're going to try again uh, to uh, to post this video, though. Uh, not because I'm so passionate about tortillas, but that's that's part of it, I suppose. The Hammonds family moved to Texas not because of access to fresh tortillas. I want to make sure that that that's understood properly, but... It didn't hurt anything. We love going to the grocery store and knowing that the tortillas that we pick up are going to be fresh, even the ones that come here by a truck from a, from a regional distribution center is still relatively fresh, still better than anything we would have gotten in in uh, in Florida. We describe going to the grocery store and picking up hot, fresh tortillas that are still steamy in the bag, and and our friends from other parts of the country don't get it. They they don't understand. In fact, they think that we're pretty silly for making such a big deal out of out of this, and uh, and that's okay. Nobody has to become like us. the uh, The old saying goes, "We mock what we do not understand," and and that's kind of the way it is with the Hammonds family and tortillas. In fact, speaking of tortillas and friends from other places, we have run into people over the years that will deliberately and perhaps even stubbornly pronounce the word tortilla because they're just determined to do so. We'll inform them more correctly, and no, we'll, we'll stick with tortilla, essentially. Every once in a while, we'll say tortilla in the Hammonds family when we feel like, you know, poking some gentle fun at people who don't know any better. Maybe that's not the best attitude in the, in the world, but it happens anyway. Kind mockery is, I suppose, still mockery. Now, the, the twist of to this, of course, is that tortilla is a Spanish word. Tortillas, we, we got presumably from our neighbors to the south, and they uh, brought this, this wonderful soft flat bread to Texas before Americans came, probably. And in Spanish, the word is pronounced tortilla, or something similar to that anyway. It's college Spanish was a long time ago. And when we see gringos like ourselves saying tortilla, We'll mock them too. We'll mock the uh, the people who don't know any better, the people who say tortilla for being ignorant, and then we'll mock the people who say tortilla as being posers. Uh, these days, I think they call it uh, cultural appropriation. Is that what they say? Uh, when you're you're trying to pose as someone who who you are not, some, trying to borrow somebody else's culture, that that sort of thing. Uh, so what you wind up with in the Hammonds house is that there are people who on one side are worthy of mockery, and there are people who, on, who are on the other side for totally different reasons, and they're worthy of mockery. And everybody who does just like I do right here in the middle, we're the good guys. We're the ones who are getting it right. It's, uh, it's kind of funny how that works out, isn't it? But that's the way that criticism oftentimes works in the Lord's church, and that's the broader point that I wanted to get at here today. The idea that we sometimes will almost invent ways to not get along with brothers and sisters in Christ, which should be just a horrific kind of concept, and I, I trust at least in concept it is horrific. We practice it so often you wonder sometimes. But the fact of the matter is God's people have always fought with each other, going all the way back to Cain and Abel, and continuing certainly through the life of the nation of Israel. There's a, a very interesting story given to us that has given rise to a word in our in our lexicon, actually, a word shibboleth, which refers to a, a word or practice of demarcation where uh, you are proved to be or not to be, as the case may be, uh, part of an inner circle. And generally speaking, it refers implicitly to something that is a pointless or really not that big of a deal, some small issue, some bit of minutia that really shouldn't matter one way or the other. And it goes back to Judges chapter 12, the story of Jephthah. Remember, Jephthah is trying to lead his people, his tribesmen, in, uh, in battle and receiving a lot of opposition. In fact, he's kind of an outcast himself and uh, had to be recruited into this, uh, into this area. He wasn't fit to live with his neighbors, his family, but he was fit to lead them in battle, apparently. At any rate, the battle goes very well. 
And then there's some trouble with the Ephraimites, who had been left out of the battle. Jephthah insisted that he sent word to them. He wanted them to come. They didn't come, but they were left out of the honor or the spoils or whatever the, the blessing would have been. They didn't get to, to be part of the battle. And so now the Gileadites of, of, uh, of Jephthah wind up fighting the Ephraimites, and 42,000 Ephraimites die in this conflict here. And central to this whole conflict is when the Ephraimites are getting beaten up and they're demonstrating themselves to be the bad guys, at least in the eyes of Jephthah and the Gileadites. There is a, a river, a border of sorts, and the Ephraimites who would join with Jephthah were challenged at this crossing point. They say, are you an Ephraimite? And the implicit message, of course, is we don't like the Ephraimites. They're staying out. And if they say, no, no, we're not Ephraimites, they would ask them to pronounce the word shibboleth. And I don't know why that particular word, but they couldn't do it. The Ephraimites apparently had some kind of uh, traditional uh, speech impediment. And they would say sibboleth instead of shibboleth. And so they would kill him because they couldn't pronounce a word properly. And that's where this idea of a ridiculously nitpicky point of distinction that might come up among God's people, uh, why the word shibboleth is, is used here. You can't pronounce a word properly, and therefore you, we can't have fellowship with you. We're going to war with you. You're the actual enemy. And, and this is a disturbing trend, actually, uh, throughout the, the history of Israel, most notably, perhaps, when the northern and southern kingdoms separate from one another. The tribe of Judah and the lineage of David, they stay faithful to God's plan, and the other tribes decide we're going to do whatever we want to do. Sometimes the line is pretty, pretty stark and, and even necessary. There are times when God's people are not acting like God's people, when they are rebelling against God, rebelling against God's proper order, and as such need to be corrected and chastised and perhaps even excluded. I would like to say most of the time that's not true. I'm not qualified to say what is most of the time or not most of the time. I can say from my personal experience, there have been plenty of situations where God's people went to war, maybe not physical bloodshed, but nevertheless war, over a matter that seems on the surface at least to have been completely and to totally avoidable, far more about ego and dogmatism and personal preferences than glorifying God. The pattern in the New Testament is very consistent. The people of God need to find a way to get along. Sometimes you can't. Sometimes people will not allow themselves to be gotten along with, and there are measures for that. But most of the time, the plan is for us to work together in fellowship, cooperation, sharing, joint participation. This word for, for uh, fellowship is, is described in various ways in the New Testament. But it all amounts to coming together and communing with one another, being part of a larger whole instead of simply a whole bunch of individuals. As long as we are a whole bunch of individuals, as long as we insist that the other worships like we worship, uh, acts like we act, says the things that we say in the way that we say them, then we're going to continue to fracture. Now, as I mentioned before, and I, maybe I'll mention again, it's an important point. There are times when we need to fracture. In 1 Corinthians chapter 11, when Paul is chastising the, the Corinthian church, therefore, the, the schisms that are existing, uh, factiousness, because in that particular case, because of the Lord's Supper, he says sometimes factions need to exist because that's how you know who's, the right, who's on the right side and who's on the wrong side. But factiousness for the sake of factiousness is not going to serve anybody's purpose except your own personal individual uh, purpose. We need to be better than that. We need to be the body of Christ. Now, how do we go about doing that? That's, that's a, a long series of lessons probably, but I'm going to give you a couple of notes here quickly uh, from my study that I think will help with regard to this. And uh, it's going to seem kind of extreme in a couple of situations. It, it may seem like uh, it's un, unnecessarily generous or unnecessarily uh, selfish or, or self-indulgent or whatever. But what I'm going to try to do here is emphasize what the Bible pattern is. If you do it the way that God tells you to do it, you're not going to go too far wrong. That's, that's what we need to focus on. What is God's plan? And God's plan is, in the first place, to be extreme, if you want to call it extreme, in limiting the fellowship that we extend. It should stand to reason 
It should be just common sense for anybody who understands the idea of authority. That if someone is not permitted into fellowship with God, that one should not be permitted into fellowship with the people of God. We can't extend fellowship farther than God has. We aren't smarter than Him. We're not holier than Him. Sometimes we're going to make mistakes. No question about that. We don't have perfect judgment like He does. But when we can draw a line, when we can see a a stark line of demarcation between those who are serving God and those who are not, we need to respect that line and we need to enforce that line. Even when it seems like we are cutting out wide swaths of people who would try to be part of our our fellowship, people who claim to be serving Jesus. Jesus told us this was going to be the case, that that not everyone who says to me, Lord, 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 will enter the kingdom of heaven in uh, Matthew 7, verse 21. And we have a lot of people these days who are saying, Lord, Lord, who are naming the name of Jesus, claiming to be Christians. And ultimately, God's going to be judge of all of these things. No question about that. But what we have in the New Testament is a single global fellowship that is governed in heaven and that we have a certain amount of custody for here on earth. And we need to start enforcing that fellowship by understanding how that fellowship was enforced in heaven, how it continues to be enforced in heaven. In Acts 2, verse 47, the Lord, Jesus, is adding to those saved people daily, those ones who were being saved. There's there's a group of saved individuals. There's only one of them. And Jesus puts saved people in that group. You are part of that fellowship. 1 John uh, one, the first few verses of 1 John 1, John talks about this fellowship. If you follow after the gospel that John preached, that Paul preached, that all of the gospel writers preached, you can have fellowship with them. And he says, our fellowship is with our Lord Jesus Christ and with the Heavenly Father. That's where we want to be. So anyone who was not saved, anyone who was not added to the body of Christ, can't be added to a local congregation. They may be really nice, they may be really rich, they may be related to somebody or whatever, but we can't add to fellowship those who Jesus has not added. And who Jesus adds is a whole series of sermons, in fact, that it's far beyond the purview of of this particular lesson. But for our purposes, we can look a few verses earlier and see what the people were doing in Acts chapter 2 to attain fellowship. And that was simply put to do the thing that Peter told them to do on the day of Pentecost, verse 38. Repent and let each of you be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of your sins. People who do that, who are willing to turn to the Lord and show their faith by putting him on in baptism, these ones were the ones who were being added to the body of the saved. And so therefore, if we... Let me rephrase that. If I as a shepherd of the Lord's people, see someone in a saying to join himself or herself to the fellowship who has not done that, who is living impenitently, who is living flagrantly in sin, someone who has not been baptized in water for remission of sins, we're going to have to to stop the, the process at that point. Not because I don't think they're good enough, but because in our wisdom as a body of elders, we don't have any confidence this person is in fellowship with God. If they're not in fellowship with God, they can't be in fellowship with us also. Now, that's an extreme position. It is pretty close to the opposite uh, approach that many, many, again, I don't want to say most, but many uh, spiritual fellowships out there are going to engage in. Some people will take you if you have a pulse, and pretty much that's good enough. You know, they'd like you to write a check every Sunday if they take you, but nevertheless, there's no questions and answers. There's no qualification. There is no interview. Well, there'll be an interview uh, in the fellowship that I'm a part of here in Georgetown, Lakewoods Drive. There is going to be a conversation because we want to make sure that as much as we can, we are faithful to the task that has been assigned to us. The shepherding that we do is under the oversight of the chief shepherd, using words from First Peter chapter uh, chapter five, rather uh, verses one through four. We're going to have to be as extreme as the Bible requires us to be, and use our best judgment, and certainly approach this prayerfully and judiciously and kindly as we try to do God's will. 
but it's going to mean excluding people who don't want to be excluded. Uh, there's, there's no apology to be offered there. That's, that's doing God's things in God's ways. Now, having said that, there's another extreme you might uh, offer on the other side, which may seem in, in, on the surface to be contradictory to the first. But once that fellowship is joined, once there is a, a partaking of fellowship in the local body, once saved people have come together and decided to work together under common oversight for a common purpose, that fellowship needs to be maintained. And the measures that are taken to continue and to extend that fellowship may themselves seem extreme. Because, again, going back to the, the point that we started with, these days it's it's easier to blow things up than it is to build things together, to strengthen things, unfortunately. And we have brethren who seem to be in the business of blowing things up. If we can just drive off all the riffraff, then we're going to be a stronger church. We're going to be a, a more connected church. Everybody's going to think the same thing. The epistles especially that we have in the New Testament, more often than not, are written almost specifically to address issues of, of debate, issues of doctrine, issues of morality that are rising up in these local churches. And Paul and the other writers admonish the church, admonish leadership to encourage connection, to correct, to fix these things, to rebuke wickedness. What we do not see, in fact, very rarely do we see, is an obligation for congregations to kick wayward members out. There are exceptions. 1 Corinthians chapter 5 is an exception. Titus chapter 3 is an exception. But generally speaking, the solution to, to fixing fellowship problems in local, in local churches is to work harder at having fellowship, to teach, to train, to love. That's what we do. And we continue to do it until it's obvious that that is not going to work. There are any number of passages we could go to to address this from a positive standpoint. I'm going to refer to Philippians chapter 1 and start reading in verse number 6. Paul writes here, For I am confident of this very thing, that he who began a good work in you will perfect it until the day of Christ Jesus. For it is only right for me to feel this way about you all, because I have you in my heart." Since both in my imprisonment and in the defense of the confirmation of the gospel, you are all partakers of grace with me. For God is my witness, how I long for you all with the affection of Christ Jesus. In this I pray that your love may abound still more and more in real knowledge and all discernment, so that you may approve the things that are excellent in order to be sincere and blameless until the day of Christ, having been filled with the fruit of righteousness, which comes through Jesus Christ to the glory and praise of God." Now, a couple of thoughts here really jump out at me as I read through this. One, we are called here partakers of grace, or the Philippians are called partakers of grace. We are by extension. Grace is that favor that God gives to those ones who need it. We don't receive grace because we deserve it. We receive grace because we are people of faith, because we have accepted Jesus Christ as our Savior, and because our God, our Heavenly Father, loves us. Grace implies error. Grace implies mistakes. It implies sin. We wouldn't need grace otherwise. And so we as the people of God, including and particularly in this context, the people of God in a particular local fellowship, we continue to be partakers of grace. God continues to favor us in one way or another. And in large measure, that favor takes the role of forgiveness. It takes the role of mercy. Surely that's the one president we want more from God more than anything else. And what we also see in this context is several references to this idea of a process, of growth, of development, that we are growing into different kind of people. Now, common sense would tell you we're not all going to grow at the same rate. I just cut my grass this morning uh, prior to recording this. All the grass blades are different heights. They don't grow at the same rate. That's the way it is with Christians. We don't grow at the same rate. You can call that a good thing, a bad thing, whatever. Maybe you're a really fast grower, and good for you if you are. Maybe your brother in the next pew is an extraordinarily slow grass grower. That's unfortunate. But we're all partakers of grace. 
and therefore we allow the Spirit to work in us at whatever speed it happens to be. We'd like to speed things up a little bit. We'd like to streamline the process. We'd like to get rid of a lot of our sinful impulses and such, if we can, and encourage our brethren to do the same. We'll absolutely do that. That's a big part of what it means to be in local fellowship. But when it doesn't seem to be working very well, or it seems to be actually degrading in its effectiveness with brothers and sisters in Christ, that doesn't mean we throw our brethren out the window. That means we double down on our efforts to teach, to train, to encourage. You wouldn't reject a child when he proves to be rebellious or, or insolent or ungrateful or whatever. You'd teach them better, discipline them a bit, chasten them a bit, absolutely. But keep them in fellowship. And far, far more often than not, that is the pattern that we see in the New Testament. Again, there are exceptions. But the pattern is for us to take these weak ones, these uh, ornery ones, these Christians with attitude, you might say, and teach them to do better. Train them. Keep them in our fellowship. In a lot of ways, it's easier to get rid of them. A homogenous church is a relatively easy church to keep track of, to, to monitor. You don't have as many hiccups. You don't have as many problems. But let me tell you, and I have some experience with this, if the church that you are a part of is determined to exclude from fellowship anyone who disagrees with anyone else, especially disagree with leadership, you're going to wind up with a very discouraged and a very small, a very under-motivated group. God asks more of us than that. We don't improve the hospital by getting rid of all the sick people. And we don't imp improve the church by getting rid of all the sinners. We are all struggling in our own ways. That's why we come together, so that we can encourage one another and draw strength from one another. Yes, there are exceptions to this. I think that's three times I've said that. But if it feels like you are going the extra mile when you're assisting your brother or sister in Christ, you ought to think about that expression, you know, and where it came from. Is it appropriate for us to go the extra mile? Is it appropriate for us to love someone who may seem on the surface to be our enemy, to turn the other cheek and, and expect our brother to be just equally ungrateful and insolent uh, with the second cheek as he was with the first. This is how Jesus loves us. This is how he has fellowship with us. And we can be grateful for that. I assure you, the offenses that we uh, cause in the eyes of Jesus are at least as bad and probably much, much worse than the offenses our brothers are committing in our vision. Jesus is, pa uh, is patient with us we need to be patient with one another until, again, it becomes obvious that we cannot be patient any longer. Within that fellowship, rule number three, and we'll wrap up with this, and we've touched on it already. While we are in that fellowship, we need to make sure that we are governing our behavior with love, with patience, with what Ephesians chapter 5, verse 21 calls submission, submitting to one another in the fear of Christ. Having this attitude, Philippians chapter 2, verses 3 and 4, that Jesus had in himself, this attitude of not just looking to your own personal things, but also to the things of others. Finding a way to prioritize other people. Again, if you have a church that is characterized by selfishness, everybody is making sure that they themselves are ministered to in the way that they deserve, in the way that they require, and they're not especially concerned with other people. You're going to have a factious, a hateful church. If you have a church that is characterized by people who are looking for opportunities to love, to serve, to encourage, to put other people first, yes, there'll be people probably who abuse that trust. There'll be people who persist in being takers and non-contributors, and God will be the judge of them like he'll be the judge of us. But whatever their attitude is or is not, we can find a way to continue to work together, to continue to love one another, to be patient with one another. Rome wasn't built in a day, and, and a perfect fellowship wasn't built in a day. It hadn't been built in 2,000 years. And if we get another 2,000 years, it won't be built then either. We see in the New Testament examples of, of one church after another that were just eaten up inside with hostility and selfishness and bitterness and pride and worldliness of every stripe, and we have the same thing today. That doesn't, I'm not suggesting that's okay, because it's not. 
And I'm not suggesting we shouldn't go to war from time to time, because we should. But not every shibboleth is an opportunity for us to take up arms against one another. We can find a way to be peaceable. We can find a way to be gentle, patient, and loving toward one another if we are determined to do that. And again, the example of Jesus ought to go a long way with regard to this. If we can appreciate what Jesus has done for us, how much he has forgiven, how patient he has been with us, even up to and including the the day of his betrayal, the day of his crucifixion, and even after that, his people continued to fail. They continued, we continued to underachieve. Your brethren will do the same thing, and sometimes you will suffer because of it. That doesn't mean we quit on one another. That means we continue to love and support and nurture one another. And may God give us the strength to do it, because we need some strength. I have, I have failed in my strength from time to time. I'm sure you have as well. What we need to do is pray to God for strength and do what we can to assist our brethren, showing one another the, their, their shortcomings, certainly, in the fear of Christ, lest you know, looking to ourselves, lest we too be tempted. Galatians chapter 6, verse 1 tells us that. Make sure that we have the right kind of attitude when we're poking the, the mode out of our brother's eye, making sure that we don't have the beam in our own eye, that sort of thing. But whatever, if, if whatever we do, positive, negative, or in between, if, if whatever we do is characterized by love, if there is a relationship there that our brethren know and rely on and know is, is going to be there all the time, then the actions that we take to secure their souls is going to be received most of the time in the spirit intended. And instead of severing our fellowship, it's going to strengthen and deepen our fellowship as we all draw closer to Jesus Christ. That's the plan, at least. It's not going to work if we are selfish. It's not going to work if we are impatient with one another. So let's make sure that we pray for that patience. Make sure that we find a way to be the people of God, including and particularly in times when we disagree with one another. Thank you very much for your, your patience. And again, apologies for the, uh, the first effort at this. Hope that we got just as good or better the second time. Thank you very much for studying along, and God bless.